Okay. Um, so in the interest of time, I think we'll go ahead and get started now. Hello, everyone. My name is Emily Morrow. I work in marketing here at Oxford University Press. I'd like to first just thank everyone for joining us today, and I also want to thank Professor Paul Bloom for taking the time out of his schedule to lead our discussion. Before we get started, I'm just going to have everyone muted on the line except for our speaker so that we don't have any issues with background noise. Um, and at the end of the session, we can unmute everyone so we can we can have a question and answer ses session. Um, keep in mind that there is a question box, so feel free to type in any questions or comments that you might have, um, and we can address them um, if time permits, or we can circle back at the end and make sure we, we answer your questions. So without so, any further ado, oh, sure. I'm not sure I see the question box if I... I have to get out of my main screen, probably. OK. Um, I can see the question box, so I can definitely um, monitor that. OK. Um, OK, sounds so, good. OK, cool. So without any further ado, I think we, we can get started now. Um, so Professor Bloom, over to you. Hi. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm looking forward to um, meeting with you all a little bit more in person when my formal presentation ends. I should also add, in case I forget to say this, that you should feel comfortable uh, following up on any of this over email. My email address is paul.bloom at yale.edu. You can just Google me, and I'm happy to answer any questions that come up that we don't get to cover in our short time together. What I want to do is I want to give a little presentation that sums up the ideas I have in a book which is coming out uh, in a few weeks called Just Babies. And, and, and what it's about is, as you can tell from the subtitle, The Origins of Good and Evil. And I, um, I, I like to begin this actually with a story. It's not my story. It's from this wonderful book by Sarah Hurdy called Mothers and Others. And in this book, Hurdy describes getting on an airplane. And the airplane is very crowded. She's had to wait in line. She's sitting in her chair. Food is coming along, but she hasn't got it yet. And somewhere in the plane, a, a baby begins to cry. And Hurdy says to herself, I cannot help from wondering what would happen if my fellow human passengers suddenly morphed into another species of ape. What if I were traveling for a plane load of chimpanzees? Any one of us would be lucky to disembark all ten fingers and toes still attached, with the baby still breathing and unnamed. Bloody earlobes and other appendages would litter the aisles. Compressing so many highly impulsive strangers into such a tight space would be mayhem, a recipe for mayhem. Yet billions of us fly each year, and this never happens. The plane never lands, and then bloody body parts fell, fall out. We manage to get along with each other, even in a place that is compressed and stress-filled as an airplane. More generally, we're nice. Our niceness manifests itself in all sorts of ways. We're kind to strangers. We're kind to strangers when we interact with them on airplanes. We leave tips in restaurants and hotels, even those we'll never return to. We give charity, and some of our charity goes to people we will never see and we never reciprocate. We have notions of fairness and, equ and equity, ideas of the proper distribution of resources, ideas of just punishment, and we often obey these norms even if it's to our own disadvantage. And finally, we have what's called, what we could say, our moral insights, such as the wrongness of slavery, sexism, and racism. So the question is, where does this all come from? There's a lot of ways to answer this question through studies of history, of culture, of biological evolution. But I'm a developmental psychologist, and one way I like to address this issue is by looking at the minds of children. Now, the idea that there could be some morality at all in the mind of a child or a baby would be considered bizarre and, and, and alien uh, for most of human history. The common sense view held by many psychologists and philosophers is that babies are blank slates. I mean, the idea is nicely summed up by this Onion headline, which says, New Study Reveals Most Children Unrepentant Sociopaths. I want to suggest that this is mistaken. And here, I'm, I'm sort of building upon um, other scholars, uh, most notably from my favorite philosopher, um, Adam Smith. Now, some of you may know Adam Smith from his famous book, Wealth of Nations, which argues that um, unfettered selfishness can, under right conditions, give rise to productive market economies where everybody benefits. But, didn't, but Smith didn't think for a moment that everybody was, in fact, selfish. He was entirely clear that this is not an accurate dis, uh, depiction of human nature. And in fact, it, he discusses this at length in his first book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, where Smith always believed to be his better book. 
and the theory of moral sentiments begins with this. However selfish soever man may be supposed, there are evidently some principles in his nature which interest him in the fortune of others and render their happiness necessary to him. That we often derive sorrow from the sorrow of others is a matter of fact too obvious to require any instances to prove it. Now for Smith, one of the mechanisms that made us care about others is what we would now call instinctive empathy. Instinctive empathy um, refers to the act of putting yourself in the shoes of another and feeling what they feel. So Smith gives an example. When we see a stroke aimed and just ready to fall upon the leg or arm of another person, we naturally shrink and draw back our own leg or arm. And when it does fall, we feel it in some measure and are hurt by it as well as to suffer. And there's all sorts of illustrations of this. This is one of my, my favorites. The picture of the man contorting in the anticipated pain of the, of the shot is a wonderful example of empathy. You, empathy is by some people uh, viewed to be a, 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 the outcome of a general tendency. We have to mirror the, the behavior of others. My favorite example of this, this is from a soccer game. And I, I forget exactly where. The guy misses a kick and clutches his head. And now look at the people around them who clutch their heads in exactly the same way. So what can we say about the emergence uh, of, of empathy? Well, even babies cry at the sounds of other crying babies. It seems that the suffering of others is something that we resonate to at a very early age. Um, and as soon as babies are able to, uh, babies and young children, when they see someone else in pain, they'll, they'll try to help. They'll pat. They'll soothe. Um, in some cases, they'll even share food or other or toys. Uh, in some very clever studies, Felix Varnikin and Michael Tomasello put toddlers in a situation in which um, they saw an adult in trouble. And then they were curious as to whether the toddler would spontaneous help, spontaneously help. And they found that, that this is often exactly what happened. So here's a clip from one of their studies. So that's one facet of morality that emerges early, where you could call a, sort of an emotional resonance to the suffering of others, however minor, and a desire to make the suffering stop. But there's another aspect of morality that's sometimes called moral sense. This is an idea developed by many scholars, including Francis Hutchinson, who was uh, Adam Smith's advisor, as when Smith was an undergraduate. And Hutchinson viewed the moral sense not in terms of a proclivity to do good things, but rather as something more akin to a perceptual sense, where just as we could tell colors and shapes and smells, we could also perceive morality, perceive right and wrong. And the emergence of this capacity, this moral sense, has been something that I've been interested in a lot of my colleagues at Yale. So um, all of this work I'll tell you about babies was done in collaboration with Karen Wynn, who's my colleague and my spouse, and as an infant lab. And what we were first interested in that got me to study the moral life of babies was um, a bunch of studies looking at social evaluation of babies. The, and, and this was done with work with Valerie Kuhlmeyer, who's now a professor at Queen's University. What we're interested in is when babies see somebody help another individual, do they expect that the person who's helped to come back and approach the one who helped? Similarly, when babies see somebody harm another individual, do they expect that character not to approach the one that harmed them? So to figure this out, we show babies little movies, little animated movies of interactions, and you could, in front of your own computer, you could put yourself in the position of the babies. This is what you would see. And then during test trial, they saw either this or this. And 
And what we found was babies looked longer, indicating surprise when the ball approached the one that helped it rather than hindered it. Now this effect holds for both 9-month-olds and 12-month-olds, but if the characters don't have faces, the effect goes away. It goes away entirely for the 9-month-olds, in fact, it flips for the 12-month-olds, suggesting that this really is a sort of social understanding we see at work. Um, I'll stop and just say, are people hearing me clearly? Is, this, is the sound working? I think it sounds great from my end. Good. Excellent. Okay. So, so then this brilliant graduate student, Kylie Hamlin, joined Cameron's lab and said, you know, you're asking a very complicated question. There's a simpler but maybe more interesting question you could ask, which is, what do babies themselves think of the characters? What do they themselves think of the good guy and the bad guy? Do they think of them as good guys and bad guys? So to study this, we moved away from uh, a looking method and towards a reaching method so babies could indicate their preferences. And so uh, here's, I'll show you a, a little clip from the study that shows you how we did this. So then, after seeing this, babies of different ages would be offered a choice. And I should tell you, for all of these studies, the color, the shape, the size of the characters is counterbalanced. And what this means is that if we have the red character as the good guy for half the babies, the red character will be the bad guy for the other half. If the good guy is on the right for half the babies, it will be on the left for the other half. And what this means is that if babies have a tendency to prefer a color or, or a shape or, or an orientation, this will wash out and you won't get any effect at all. It's a way of making sure that the effect you get is, um, is due to the fact that you're interested in it. Also, when, um, when the babies are offered the alternatives, uh, the person making them the offer doesn't know who, who is the good guy and bad guy, so it can't bias the baby. And finally, parents close their eyes when uh, the baby makes the choice. This is an example of a choice. And here are our results. And as you can see, for both the 10-month-olds and 6-month-olds, almost everybody chooses a good guy. Now you could wonder, are they being directed towards the good guy? Are they being directed against the bad guy? Or are there effects in both directions? And, and, uh, and so to test this, we compare to the other studies where we compare the good guy with the neutral guy. And there we find they prefer the good guy. And the bad guy with the neutral guy, and there we find they prefer the neutral guy, suggesting they have tendencies to go both in both directions, to both prefer the good and avoid the bad. Um, now, we did this work and it got a lot of interest, and we had various controls designed to sort of preclude possibly other things going on, but still it's reasonably be skeptical about this. This is just one set of studies using one specific method. Maybe there's something funny about going up the hill versus going down the hill. And so, to explore this, we, we started using different methods, and these are from experiments that Karen and Kylie did, and I won't give you the data, but I'll just give you examples of the sort of uh, studies that babies saw. So, I'll let you watch this, and I'll let you decide who the good guy and who the bad guy are.
you might not be surprised to hear that babies, like the rest of us, um, preferred the puppet who gave the ball back rather than the puppet who ran away with it. And um, I'm not going to show you data for this, but I'll show you a little clip of uh, a kid making a decision. Now, the question that could rise from all of this is to what extent is this moral? To what extent is what we're seeing in babies continuous with what we talk about in the adult moral judgments? An only honest answer is we don't know. But um, we can look at it in a different way. So one property that seems to be related to morality is reward and punishment. Uh, I don't like raisins, but if you like raisins, I'm not tempted to reward you. And if you don't like raisins, I'm not tempted punish you because this is because for me liking reasons isn't a moral kind of thing. It's just a preference. On the other hand, I don't know, I don't like killing babies. So if you stop somebody from killing babies, I'd be prone to think you should be rewarded. And if you kill babies, I should think that you should be punished. So if we're right that these uh, methods tap moral understanding, you would expect them to, to correspond to moral behavior. And so what we did with these kids, and these are with older kids, because we're going to ask a little bit more of them. We asked them to, uh, we showed them characters doing good things and bad things, and then we asked them to either reward one of the characters or punish one of the characters. We found that when you ask them to reward them, they tend to reward uh, the good guy. And when you ask them to ask them to punish them, they tend to uh, prefer to punish the bad guy. We also find in subsequent studies that babies like characters who reward good guys, and they like characters who punish bad guys, but they don't like characters who reward bad guys, and they don't like characters who punish good guys. So at this point, you might think, think that we've answered the question that we started with, uh, that babies are naturally nice, niceness is part of our human nature, and um, I could kind of end this presentation here. But, you know, I, the talk uh, wouldn't have gone the way it did if I thought that was the answer. I actually think that, that what we find is that babies and young children are strikingly limited in certain ways. I think we're naturally nice to those around us. But what about strangers? How do we instinctively respond to strangers? There, the answer is fear and hatred. I think this is our natural default. This default shows up in young children who at a certain age begin to show extreme anxiety when being approached by a stranger. And it shows up in people in small-scale societies. So Jared Diamond describes individuals who live in Papua New Guinea. He says, to venture out in one's territory to meet other humans, even if they lived only a few miles away, was equivalent to suicide. Margaret Mead who's famously known for um, her support of the lifestyle of so-called uh, members of primitive societies, was kind of blunt about how they respond to strangers. Most primitive tribes feel like you run across one of those subhumans from a rival group in the forest, the most appropriate thing to do is bludgeon them to death. We also see this in our children. So remember I told you about how children will cry to the pain of others and will often soothe or share uh, when, they, when they see another person in pain. Well, this is true but they are much more likely to do this when that other individual is somebody close to them, a member of their family, somebody they're familiar with. Or take this study, the Warnikin and Tomasello study I told you about. It's true that the kid helped this, this adult, but the kid was not a stranger to this adult. They had played a game before. And when other investigators read the study and didn't have them play a game before, the amount of helping dropped by over half, suggesting again that when somebody is really a stranger, it is not natural to help them or to care for them. Along with, um, with Mark Sheskin, who was a graduate student working with me and Karen, and Karen Wynn, we, we started to look at the development of kindness to strangers using the same methods that uh, people have used in behavioral economics. So what they do is, um, what we, is we give children, we tell children they can play a game they get to choose between different options. 
they get to choose between, in this case, the girl gets to choose between the green and the blue. And the items closest to her are ones she gets to keep. And the ones furthest from her are ones that go to a stranger. And she's told, I'm going to go to a stranger. You'll never see the stranger. He'll never see you. Um, but, uh, but, but you could choose how much you get and how much the stranger gets. Now, um, they are playing for poker chips, but they're told the poker chips can be exchanged later for toys. So imagine you gave a child a choice between 1-1 one, one versus 2-2. Two, two. And what the notation means is one for the child himself, one and one for the other child, versus two for the child himself and two for the other child. Now you would expect that they understand the game, and if they're rational, they should go for 2-2. Two, two. Because they get more, they get two versus one, so if they're selfish, it works out. And the other person gets more, two versus one. So if they're altruistic, it works out. And in fact, that's what they choose. But I'll tell you something interesting with the four and seven-year-olds, four to seven-year-olds. Imagine this is the contrast between one, one versus two, three, and one, one versus, sorry, one, zero versus two, two. Now you might think this is a no-brainer. Two, three is, is, is if you, you should choose two, three over one, one because you get more, two versus one, and the other person gets more. You should choose two, two over two, zero, because you get more, two versus one, and the other person gets more, two versus zero. But you might notice there's something a little bit funny about those contrasts. You might imagine that somebody would be tempted to choose two, three to, over, uh, sorry, to choose one, one over two, three, because then, although they have overall less, they don't end up having a relative disadvantage. Similarly, you might imagine somebody choosing 1, 0 over 2, 2, because again, although they have overall less, they, um, they do have a relative advantage over this stranger. And in fact, for the younger children, this is exactly uh, what we find. I presented this work at a Jewish religious group a little while ago, and somebody told me later that it was reminiscent of a Jewish folk tale in which an envious man, uh, an angel comes down to earth and meets with an envious man and says to the envious man, you can have whatever you want, but your neighbor will have double. And the man thinks for a while and says, I want you to pluck out one of my eyes. I told this to my lab group and one of my students who's Irish said there's an Irish folk tale which is similar, except the punchline was, I want you to beat me half to death. We are not naturally nice to strangers. We don't naturally feel their pain. We don't naturally seek out to help them. And in, in, the, in games in which we get to distribute resources, we will actually take less to avoid having a stranger get more. But we've gotten better. If our natural state is an antipathy towards strangers, right now we have kindness to strangers, uh, uh, intuition about fairness and equity, and even more insights. And the question is, what happened? Where did this all come from? And I think there's different answers. So one answer, which, which is often the first thing that sort of cynical people think about, is interdependence. This is a view spelled out by Robert Wright in this wonderful book, Non-Zero. So Wright, um, Wright suggests that, that people have become better to each other. Our moral circle has expanded due to a form of enlightened self-interest. Um, for people who live in a market economy, um, they benefit from continued interactions with others, and other people become you know, better dead than, better alive than dead. Um, just if, if you're dealing with somebody and, it's, and it's, it's a good, productive relationship, a positive sum relationship, then your fate and their fate become intertwined. I always thought that was sort of a speculative idea, but some nice, a nice study came out a while ago that supports it by Joe Henrik et al. And what the Joe Henrik et al. did was they looked at 15 different populations and got them to play economic games involving interactions with strangers. And what they did was they plotted their generosity on these games as a function of their market integration, that is the percentage of purchased calories in diet. Um, and what this, this comes down to is the measure basically, basically how enmeshed are you in the market. So a hunter-gatherer might get very, might get, uh, very few uh, of their calories by paying for them, while somebody like me gets 99% of their calories by paying for them. Uh, my wife grows some tomatoes in the garden, so that's the 1% maybe. 
turns out, the more capitalist a society you are, the nicer you are to strangers. And this is under the logic that that right spells out that capitalism, that market interactions, foster a sort of habit of caring for others. That's one factor. Here's the second factor, the extension of empathy. And particularly, I'm interested in the extension of empathy through stories. Um, it's long been understood that you can use stories, you can try to use stories to inculcate moral values into somebody. There's some, so if you're a parent of sort of liberal and progressive values, you might give your child a story like Heather has two mummies, which talks about the merits of non-traditional families. If you're more conservative, you may give your child quite a different kind of book to appeal to different intuitions. But in general, people believe that these stories that convey moral virtues have a powerful and positive moral effect on our lives. I'm actually skeptical of this. There's very little evidence to support the fact that children are possibly swayed by these sorts of stories. And um, I think in part because they get sussed them out as obvious attempts at persuasion. I think stories have more of a moral value, more of an effect, when they're taken as information sources. And, and one particular thing they could do is they could take anonymous strangers who we are by nature unmoved by and transform them into people who matter, make them feel, make us feel about them as if they were friends or family. Um, the, the need to do so was made explicit by many people, so Stalin said perhaps apocryphally, a million deaths is a tragedy, uh, a single death is a tragedy, a million deaths is a statistic. And Mother Teresa said, if I look at the mass, I will never act. If I look at the one, I will. And there's research to support this. So for instance, in a classic study by, uh, by Deborah Small, Paul Slovic, and George Lowenstein, they would give people stories of uh, statistical information about a famine and see how much money um, they would donate. And in the study, they donated a bit over a dollar. And they compared this with people who were told not about the statistical information, but about, uh, about a girl, uh, a seven-year-old girl who's poor and, and needs help. And it turns out that when faced with the troubles of the individual, people are far more generous. None of this will be a secret to people who, uh, who are in the charity business. They're well aware that if you want to solicit money from people, you, you don't just throw statistics at them. You give them individuals. You give them faces. It's possible that this empathetic extension to these individuals in other places can then spread and expand to whole groups. This is an idea that was defended by Martha Nussbaum talking about Greek tragedies. Although all of the future citizens who saw ancient tragedies were male, they were asked to have empathy of the suffering of many whose lot could never be theirs, such as Trojans and Persians and Africans, such as wives and daughters and mothers. And there's some evidence this happens uh, in the real world. I'll give my favorite example from American history. This is Harriet Beecher Stowe. Um, Harriet Beecher Stowe, the story goes that at the beginning of the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln invited her into the White House and said, so you're the little lady who started this great big war. And he was talking about her book, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Now, Uncle Tom's Cabin was not a book about theology or philosophy or law. But rather, it was a novel that got their readers to put themselves in the shoes of slaves. And this had a powerful moral effect. And, and, and it was one of the, the forces that led to the abolition of slavery. So I've talked about, about two forces that, that expand uh, our morality. And now I want to turn to the third, which to me is perhaps the most reasonable most interesting and most powerful. I'll just stop to ask, am I still coming through? Is the sound still working? Sounds great. If anyone has any questions, um, feel free to use the question box. Yes, if you want at this point, I, 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 if we actually even want to take a break at this point for about five, 10 minutes for any questions, give me a, give me a 30 second pause. I have to run out and okay. just check on something. And I'll come right back. And then I'll take, I'll take questions if there are. Sure. So for all of our attendees, um, if you have a question, feel free to press the little hand icon that you'll see on your dashboard. Um, that's the raise hand icon. Um, and we can unmute you, and you can pose your question to the group. Or 
Um, if you would rather type your question, please feel free to use, use the question box. And once again, thank you for joining us. Um, if you have any questions that you would you would like to, to post after the session, you can feel free to email them to me at, at the email address that you you signed up for this presentation. Okay, I'm back. Hello. Okay, great. I think we're we're ready whenever you are. Um, do I have questions? Um, no questions. No questions okay. yet, but we can definitely take some more. At the okay, end. we'll save them then. And I'm sorry, but I'm doing this at home, and I had a little dog out. Um, okay, so reason. In a lovely discussion in this book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, Steve Pinker points out that the Old Testament tells him to love his neighbors. The New Testament tells him to love his enemies. But in reality, he doesn't love either one of them. But he knows it's not right to exploit them, to torture them, to kill them. He knows he has an obligation under some circumstances to help them. And he knows this not because of the pull of their emotions, but because of the pull of reason. And to make his case, he gives a famous example from Adam Smith. And I'm going to repeat the example, though I'm going to edit it somehow in some mild ways to make it more clear and palpable to a, a 21st century audience. So imagine you hear about the death of thousands of strangers. You, you, um, you, you open up your web browser, you, you go online, and it turns out that, you, that uh, thousands of strangers have died in, in Brazil, in Afghanistan, in China, in, in, in Argentina, in New Zealand, uh, in Maui, in some place you don't know. Imagine how you would feel. And in fact, this shouldn't be such a difficult exercise because this happens to you all the time. Now compare. How would you feel if you learned that tomorrow you were going to lose your little finger? So Smith has an answer to this. Smith says that somebody who learned about the death of thousands of strangers would be maybe say, oh, that's too bad. I wish there would be something that would be done. But that night he was sleep sounding. But if you're going to learn, lose, you're going to learn, sorry, if you lose, you're going to learn, you lose. If you learn, you're going to lose your little finger the next day. That would be shocking. That would be emotionally engaging. You would not sleep a wink that night. So the question then arises, does it follow that someone would sacrifice thousands of lives to save his little finger, since the little finger seems to matter so much more? And Smith writes, human nature startles with horror at the thought. Then he asks, when our passive feelings are almost always so sordid and so selfish, how comes it that our active principles should often be so generous and so noble? And his answer is, it is reason, principle, conscience. This calls to us with a voice capable of astonishing the most presumptuous of our passions, that we are but one of the multitude, in no respect better than any other in it. And this last part is sometimes described as a principle of impartiality. And this is something which shows up over and over again in religion and in philosophy. In every moral system, there's some degree, there's some acknowledgement that what it is to have a moral system involves stepping out of your own situation and into any arbitrary other persons. This is the logic between the many versions of the golden rule. It underlines uh, philosophical perspectives like utilitarianism, where you just add up the pleasures and pains uh, without regard to where they come from. Um, or a Kantian system, where there's a categorical imperative that, that demands the same of everybody, or Adam Smith's own impartial spectator, or John Rawls' claim that we should reason about morality from uh, the standpoint of the veil of ignorance. All of these share this core notion, which I don't think is in our genes, but I think it's invented over and over, it's discovered over and over again um, of impartiality. And, um, and, and it's not just limited to philosophers. So my favorite example is at the end of Casablanca, where, uh, where the Humphrey Bogart character has to tell his lover that they must separate. And when she demands to know why, 
who responds like this, and I'll spare you my attempt at a Humphrey Bogart imitation. It doesn't take much to see that the problems of three little people don't amount to hill of beans in this crazy world. In this regard, this appreciation of the importance of impartial principles provides a motivation for the extension of empathy. It's why we might choose to care about other people in a faraway land. It could explain why we choose to extend our imagination to others. And it, it, it occurs in communities and develops over time. And I'll end by suggesting that in this regard, morality is a lot like science. For one thing, it shows directionality. So here's a graph from Pinker's book. It's white attitudes to interracial marriage in the United States. Now, for me, I would say this shows moral progress. But you may not agree with that. Some people don't like thinking about progress. You might have philosophical objections to the very idea of progress. Fine. But that's I'll, I'll, there's one thing I will insist. This is not a random walk. This is a directional line. And I think the directionality of it is akin to the directionality you find in scientific change and scientific progress. Similarly, there's an accumulation of insight. So it's not me who discovered electrons, germs, and dinosaurs, and it's not contemporary scientists who discovered them either. But now that we know about them, we could build upon them, and science could progress by building upon the insights of prior generations. Similarly, it's not me who figured all this out, who figured out uh, that uh, slavery is wrong. But now that I know this, know this, I and others can build up upon it. So, where does our niceness come from? What I've suggested in this brief presentation is that it's two main sources. Part of our niceness is hardwired, it's bred in the bone, it's part of human nature. But part of it isn't. Part of it is something which, in fact, to achieve it, we have to, to go against our genetic proclivities, go against human nature. Um, and so it's not natural. It's instead the product of our reasoning, uh, I'm sorry, of our compassion, our, our reasoning, and, and uh, our imagination. And I'll end with that, and I'll take questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Professor Bloom. And again, um, to all of our attendees, feel free to raise your hand using the raise hand function, and I can unmute you for any questions or comments, or feel free to pose them in the question box. Okay. Um, it looks like we we might not. Oh, I see a question here. Um, this is how does your perspective of morality in babies and children align or not with Gopnik's? Uh, Allison Gopnik. She yes. has a brother, Adam Gopnik, who's written a lot. Um, yes. I'm, I'm very much of a fan of Gopnik's work. I don't know if she's ever talked about more. Well, no, she has, she has one article about morality where she raises a very interesting point that I'm very sympathetic with. So as you know, most of Alison Gopnik's work is cognitive development and basic acts of learning. And she hasn't done much research on morality, any research as far as I know. But she wrote this lovely little article um, where she points out that so much of the philosophy of morality and so much of the moral psychology that's been built from this philosophy of morality focuses on abstract problems dealing with strangers. Um, I imagine some of you have heard about the trolley problem. Um, there's all these moral problems involving strangers. But in the real world, Gottman points out, um, morality often involves intimate relations. Not my obligation to a hundred strangers, but my obligation to my son or my daughter, my mother or my father, my friends. And if you go to a, a textbook in philosophy um, or a textbook on moral psychology, you look up words like son, daughter, friend, family, you will find nothing. Contemporary philosophers and moral psychologists ignored that. And Gopnik argues correctly, I think, that this is a huge mistake. She also points out that, that it's a huge mistake that's been made possible by the fact that the people working in this business have almost always been men, many who of whom had very little contact with the day-to-day -day business of child raising being part of, of, of uh, running a family. And so, um, so in that way, I think my views align very much with Gottman. I think that's an important point. 
Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you um, to Jen Dyer Seymour for that great question. Thanks, Jen. Um, we do have another question from Terry Rust. She's interested in um, the references for the study involving the 1-1 one, one versus the 2-3 choices and also the name of your wife for the infant studies references. Ah, um, the, so, so um, if she wants all the references for all of this work in one tidy package, she can go, go get my book, Just Babies. But, um, but, but uh, my wife is Karen Wynn and, and I'm Paul Bloom. And if you go to our website, uh, either one of our websites, you will find access to all of the primary articles that I've been talking about. Great, you know thank you, Professor. Article. And well, thank you, Carrie Rest, for that question. Thank you. Um, okay, we do have another question from Connie Veldnick. Uh, she's wondering if you see any parallel developments in morality in non-human primates. Ah, that's a great question. I have a colleague of mine, Lori Santos, who studies um, some of these same issues with capuchin monkeys and rhesus monkeys. And of course there's scholars like Franz de Waal who have done hugely important work on the morality of non-human primates. The data is complicated. I'll tell you two things that, that, that they seem to share with us. Some non-human primates seem to share uh, the sort of empathetic response to suffering and sometimes a desire to make the suffering go away. So chimpanzees will soothe um, other chimpanzees in pain by patting them or stroking them, which is something humans do as well. So that's one. The second thing that they have um, that they have that we share is they have some sense of fairness in that they get really upset if they get less than the other person, the other ape. So this is true not just for primates but also for dogs. So there's some lovely studies where you give a dog a treat and then um, and then, and then give another dog a smaller treat. And the one that gets a smaller treat gets annoyed, gets, gets frustrated. So those are things that they share with us. Some things they may not share with us. With us. There's no evidence of sort of moral judgments that we find uh, in our babies can be done by any other species. And, you know, I, I have an open mind as to whether or not this could happen. It's, it's an interesting question. But there's no evidence for this. Finally, one thing we have, sorry, I just going to say, finally, one thing we have as mature humans is we, um, we have a notion of fairness that applies even when we are, not, we, we are not ourselves losing out. I recognize it's unfair for me to get two and you to get three. Um, and it's not clear any other species can, can do that. That's really interesting. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for that great question, Professor Veldnick. Um, uh, we have a question from Betsy Robinette, who's wondering if we'll get a copy of the presentation. Um, and I should just let the group know that we did record this session, so you'll be able to view it on our YouTube page, and it'll mm -hmm. be posted on our blog. Um, so if anyone else has any questions, please feel free to type it into the question box or, or raise your hand. Okay. Um, I think I think that sounds I think it sounds like it's time to wrap it up. So um, thanks again to everyone. I'll be sending out a follow-up email um, that'll have a link to a short webinar survey, and we'd uh, very much appreciate if you could fill it up so that we can improve all of our webinars going forward. Um, and as I mentioned, we do have a recording of this session, which you can view on our YouTube page if you'd like to watch it again. Um, and please feel free to be in touch if you have any questions at all. And once again, uh, a big thank you to everyone for attending today and sharing your your great thoughts with us, and a, a big thanks to Professor Bloom for presenting today. Thank you very much for having me. And again, people should, shouldn't hesitate to be in touch with me if you have any specific questions. Okay. Thanks so much. Have a great day, everyone.